to the uh, 33rd meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item of the agenda, can I remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to decide whether to take item three and its consideration of the draft budget 2018-19 report at any future meetings in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The second item of business today is to hear evidence on the Scottish Government's budget. We will hear from Rosanna Cunningham, the Cabinet Secretary, Keith Connell, Deputy Director of Natural Resources, Linda Pooley, Deputy Director of the Rural and Environment Sciences and Analytical Services Division, Neil Ritchie, the Branch Head of the Environmental Quality Division, and Graham Black of Marine Scotland. Um, we, as you would uh, anticipate, Cabinet Secretary, have a series of questions for you, and Donald Cameron is going to kick off. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, can I ask, uh, begin with by asking a very general question around priorities? Um, what is the Cabinet Secretary's view on the relative priority given to financial support uh, for her portfolio over recent years? Um, do you mean in global terms, in, in, or in terms of the government's priorities uh, in relation to her, into your, to your portfolio? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not really understanding what you're looking for there. I mean, obviously, our overall portfolio budget has gone up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, there's more money in climate change. We've got to roll out the land uh, reform uh, uh, actions, and that has required. Uh, a further allocation because of the Register of Controlling Interests. Um, and I think um, I'm right in saying, and I'm looking at Neil Ritchie, there's extra money going into uh, some of the flood uh, uh, work that SEPA does. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, I think in terms of how I see the, the portfolio priorities, I mean, I think that's a reasonable uh, um, uh, approach to have taken. Climate change, obviously, um, is the biggest thing, or one of the biggest things, facing government at the moment. It's not entirely embedded in my portfolio. There are actions right across portfolios. Um, uh, we are always conscious of the uh, flood risk, and that is, of course, often related to the climate change issues. And I think the actions that come out of the land reform legislation are an absolute requirement, uh, um, uh, and therefore required to be um, prioritised in the way they have. So I'm, I'm content um, uh, with, with those things. Um, it, you know, do I think it would be great to have more money? Absolutely. But um, in terms of where we are, and in the, you know, given that we've had a kind of modest increase in the overall portfolio budget, I think I'm fairly content. I want to come on to land reform in a moment, but can I just ask, is there a methodology um, upon which decisions for spend... Um, is made. Uh, again, are you ask, you're asking me with a methodology within the portfolio. Within your portfolio, yes. Well, to a certain extent, I suppose I've already indicated the areas where we've seen um, an increase, and there, you know, uh, um, I mean, that is really in terms of how we view um, the current priorities and and uh, challenges. There's not a mathematical formula for this. Um, that there's a considerable part of the budget which is an absolutely fixed budget in a sense because if you're talking about staff across the various uh, um, bodies like SNH and SEPA and Marine Scotland, though those, those budgets, a big part of those budgets is a kind of um, given um, uh, and the, the amount that you've got that's free budget, if you like, um, is much, much smaller than the amount that is fixed. Um, uh, so there isn't uh, there isn't a kind of mathematical um, thing that comes into play that that works out across the board. Um, uh, I have conversations uh, um, with the uh, finance secretary um, about where, if he was looking for savings, where how we would manage that. But in actual fact, we've had a modest increase across the portfolio. So I think. You know, given everything we've done well, and I don't want to poke the bear. <laughs> I mean, you spoke about fixed and fixed areas and, and free areas. I mean, are there any areas that you see are, are sacred in a way or are core areas which must be protected? <laughs> well, um, 
Uh, I mean, I think that's a really difficult question to ask because at any one time, um, things will change. So, you know, 15 years ago, you probably wouldn't, for example, have had somebody sitting here saying climate change is an absolute kind of core area, but here we are, uh, and it is. So any, any decisions that you make in any one year or one decade even um, uh, are, are subject to change. Um, I think from my perspective, in terms of the way the overall portfolio works, I think I'm absolutely uh, um, of the view that protecting the money that goes to flooding is absolutely essential. Um, we got to a pretty good place after we passed the flood uh, um, legislation um, uh, back in 2009. Uh, and I think we've gotten to a good place as to how the management of all of that works. And I would absolutely feel that that has to be, you know, protected at all costs. And I would never want to see a diminution in the amount of money um, uh, uh, that went to flooding. I think that's really, really important. Climate change is increasing in importance, so I would only expect that to become an increasing pressure. Um, but as I indicated, it's a pressure borne right across government, not just in my portfolio. Um, once we have achieved the um, uh, rollout of what the land reform legislation required, um, uh, um, there might be an interesting discussion to be had about where what I would then see as freed up money goes, um, but I would like to see it stay in, in, uh, in the land uh, sector um, uh, in some way, shape or form. Um, there are, I think, what will become increasing priorities that will make the conversation going forward um, slightly different. Um, uh, but that's maybe a, um, for a, another evidence session in the future. Um, can I ask about, um, given that we've seen over the last week um, what might be described as a Scottish-specific approach to taxation, and given the uh, forecast of the Fiscal Commission um, uh, in relation to productivity and growth over the next five years, which um, don't paint a, a particularly optimistic picture, um, do you take a, uh, are you going to take a different approach to managing resources in terms of contingency planning um, if there's sort of less certainty around uh, funding amounts that might be available? Contingency planning in I mean I think all the, the different groups within the within the portfolio I mean SNH SEPA the rest of them will have um, will have their own um, uh, mechanisms for thinking about contingency planning. From the point of view of uh, um, climate change, I've already indicated that, that I think that will be an increasing pressure um, uh, and therefore we will always have to ensure uh, that that's well funded. But I'm not entirely sure, you know, you're, you're, you're asking me about a kind of much bigger budget issue here that I guess than I'm, um, than I'm, I'm really confident of responding and I don't know if any of the officials feel that that question is one that they think they could more usefully contribute to, but I, I think it's maybe just a bit a kind of a, above the sense of where we would be, because that would be one, I think, for the finance secretary to really be, be, uh, uh, be dealing with. Do any of the officials want to ask about contingency planning within their areas? I think from, from uh, all of our viewpoints, we're, we're always doing contingency planning, so we can always see that, that uh, you know, money could go up or down depending on, on priorities or, or particular demands. I think we also all are looking into the longer term in terms of things like charging to try and be able to, to balance out some of those longer term pressures that we might face. But contingency planning is always is part of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're in a, in a different position now than, than where we've been before. Be planning exercises around Brexit at the moment. Well, that's almost an impossible contingency to plan for just right now, because in terms, certainly in terms of cost. I mean, we are, for all of us, you know, confronting, and I dare say in various parts of this morning's evidence, this will come up. But, you know, much of what we do in this portfolio um, it, it, it involves funding that comes from European sources. 
Um, and there is simply no, at the moment, no answer to the question of what happens when that funding ceases. Brexit in detail in a moment. It was just, yeah, I guess I, it, that I, is the biggest I mean, kind of it, elephant yes, in the room at the moment. Except at the moment that there really isn't a contingency plan that you can put in place because we don't have any certainty as to what's actually going to happen. Yeah. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, thank you. Um, while I accept there is no contingency plan in place at the moment, have you had an indication that there will be talks and discussions around that between yourselves and the UK government, presumably in due course, if they're not yet in place? <laughs> I'm not so sure I would go as far as to say it in those terms. Um, uh, there, there's some head nodding goes on if the issue of the funding gap um, appears in a conversation at the moment, but there is no certainty. I think there are one or two areas of funding where there's been an indication that it will go, it'll subsist until 2020, until the actual programme budgets run out, but there's no discussion about subsequent to that. And there's no real, I mean, we're nowhere near being in the space where those conversations would take place. Because at the moment, the conversations are still not so much about money as about process. The Brexit in a moment. Um, <coughs> Stuart Stevenson and Mark Ruskell. Uh, do any of the officials have any knowledge of any contingent liabilities they might, in the course of the next financial year, might have to bring to the attention of the Minister and perhaps thereafter the Audit Committee? And that's for the officials rather than the Minister. Right, I'm getting shaking heads. That's fine, Camina. <laughs> OK, Mark Roscoe. Can I ask about the wider capital infrastructure budget? There's £4 billion getting invested in capital infrastructure. And I think the, uh, it was the Low Carbon Infrastructure Task Force that did an analysis of the 2015 budget which showed that uh, just over half of that, of that infrastructure budget was being spent on low carbon infrastructure. Um, however, if you look at the same analysis for this year, uh, it's down to about 26%. So does that make the meeting of climate change targets harder or easier? Um, I think, if I remember correctly, there are some of that headline figure is because of some technical changes in the way things are put in place. If you just give me a few moments just to, um, just to have a look. Um, the budget for the low carbon economy is staying the same. This is more about the wider capital investment in infrastructure and how that impacts on your portfolio, Cabinet Secretary. So if we're spending a lot less on low carbon infrastructure, my question is, how will that impact on the meeting of our stretch climate change targets and what kind of input have you had into discussions around that capital <coughs> infrastructure programme? Uh, I'm not conscious of there being an infrastructure issue from my perspective, um, I, that, those are not generally conversations uh, uh, um, in which I would be involved. Um, the low carbon infrastructure, uh, I'm assuming, will cover things like electric vehicle charging, etc. cetera. Um, I presume that's the kind of thing that is that is that is meant by low carbon infrastructure, um, uh, but um, and and obviously there's going to be an expansion there. So from the perspective, I mean, I, is there a particular thing that 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 is a? Uh, it, it's the whole thing. So four thousand million pounds is being spent on cap capital infrastructure. Is that capital infrastructure that's going to lock us in to higher carbon emissions going forward to 2040 and 2050, or is it going to reduce it? And the analysis shows that we're not investing in low carbon infrastructure. So I'm, I'm trying to understand. Well, there isn't going to be. I mean, there is going to be investment in low carbon infrastructure because we wouldn't be able to roll out the electric vehicle uh, uh, setup without low carbon infrastructure. So it's not that there isn't 
investment yes, in low glass. carbon infrastructure. Yeah. I mean, you're, presumably you're talking about things like roads, etc. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about what's in the carbon in the infrastructure investment plan in its entirety. Okay. I mean, I haven't I, I haven't looked at the infrastructure investment plan in its entirety to try and assess the impact on climate change. Um, that would be uh, uh, a matter for Keith Brown, I think, in the economy brief. Um, I mean, there are aspects of infrastructure which, from my perspective, are absolutely essential for what we do. But most of that is around the transport um, and the efficiency program, the uh, energy efficiency programs, um, on, which is another big infrastructure uh, project. So how does infrastructure spend feed into the setting of a new target under the forthcoming climate change bill and the climate plan? Well, I presume these will all be part of that discussion. I'm sorry I didn't come to this committee with a detailed understanding of the future infrastructure plans in respect to the budget. <laughs> I think Mr Roscoe's point is the percentage of uh, spend that is on low carbon projects has gone down. And the, the point here is, does that potentially create a difficulty around meeting our climate change targets going forward and create a difficulty for you as the Environment uh, Secretary? Well, I'm not conscious at the moment that any of my officials have raised a significant concern. I mean, clearly there are infrastructure projects that will be of huge benefit uh, uh, to my portfolio, but I haven't had raised uh, uh, by my climate change <coughs> officials any major concerns in respect of, you know, potential future infrastructure projects and their impact on uh, on climate change. As I've indicated, there are infrastructure projects which are directly related to and and will significantly impact in a good way um, our our climate change targets. Um, uh, I, I'm I need to come back to the committee uh, on some of the others, but I'm I'm not being I'm not having that flagged up to me as a problem from within my own uh, team of climate change officials. Can I just focus in on one national infrastructure priority, then that's investment in measures to tackle fuel poverty. Um, there hasn't been an increase in that this year. Has there been consideration of the use of financial transactions, i.e., loans? to help incentivise... I'm sorry, I don't know that. And that is not a policy which is one that I have control over. There has a new ministerial, um, uh, <clears throat> cross-ministerial group has been set up to discuss fuel poverty issues across a number of portfolios, and that may very well be one of the issues that does get raised. Um, but I'm not conscious of that at the moment, but I wouldn't like to say it hasn't been raised because it's not a policy um, within my portfolio remit. Does that not impact on your portfolio in terms of the well, ability I think of the Scottish Government that, to meet climate change targets? Well, indeed, and that's you know the point I made about the energy efficiency programme is precisely that. We want to press ahead with the energy efficiency programme um, in a way that meets both the fuel poverty targets and doesn't cut across the climate change targets. That is an active discussion. But at the level of discussing things like what did you say? F what financial transactions, uh, loans, which are available no, for Scottish not Government that, to loan out to... Sure, but we're not at that. Oh, that's, okay. If that's going to be part of that conversation, um, we're not, I'm, not, I'm not conscious of that right. at the moment okay. being so part of the conversation. But, this, the, but we've, we've begun to talk about this cross-portfolio because clearly the drive to push down fuel poverty um, uh, if one isn't careful, uh, could create problems in terms of climate change targets, and the need for the two to be uh, progressed together is really important. Claudia Beamish, very briefly. Right, uh, thank you, Kevin. Just very briefly, good morning, um, Cabinet Secretary, and to your officials. I mean, I think obviously this is a complex area, but we have been uh, sent the details of the funding for climate change mitigation measures. Um, across the budget um, as, as they relate to our portfolio. And um, I think it's just helpful if, from the committee perspective, if we can 
understand, if not today, but um, hopefully in writing from yourself or your officials about how, how these do interconnect, because it is so vital. And I think that, that that's one area that I've looked at quite closely. And for instance, there is, under services on page 11 of that document, there's low carbon economy, and then it refers to the delivery of low carbon infrastructure transition program. And there, there's a whole range of areas, um, uh, unfortunately not marine, and I'm not sure why, but where, where there, there is the cross-reference. So I think from the point of view of our, our committee, I, I, well, I, if uh, someone may want to contradict me, but I think it's important that we can try to tease these things out. I that, but these are not my portfolios. No, I understand so that creates that. a bit of a problem for me yeah. um, uh, um, if we move into too much detail. I mean, I, 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 can, I, I have the same paper, yeah. and the low carbon economy um, draft budget. Um, uh, <coughs> is the same as the previous years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was just highlighting that as one of the yeah. areas that we might have the an The energy interest efficiency in. and policy implementation yeah. looks to have increased. So I, I'm, you know, looking at the, the, the same numbers and, you know, the total services budget has increased. So I, I, I'm presuming within that, uh, uh, you know, that, that is a positive rather than a negative. So the budgets have not... No, I'm, I'm not saying know. it isn't, Cabinet Secretary. I'm just highlighting that as one of the areas where we might have an interest beyond um, or cross-threaded with other portfolios. I, well, of course there's an interest. What I'm, the point I'm making is that I can't, if, if I can't deal with these particular issues in great detail because they're not my portfolio issues. Um, and some of the decision-making within them. My colleagues don't come to me to clear a decision that they may make within that. If, that, if that's what people are, are thinking is happening, that's not how it's happening. Each of them is charged with the responsibility to ensure that the decisions that they are making um, uh, are consonant with our overall targets, and that does mean climate change targets. And that's how this is identified mindful of the requirements of the climate plan uh, for each of their portfolios as they arrive at such decisions? Well, they have to sign their, the relevant sections off themselves. So they are more than mindful of it. They're, they're aware of what is expected um, and uh, will have to ensure within their um, relevant areas that they do keep that uh, in mind. There's, there's clearly an opportunity and a need for this committee to look at that in the context of the climate plan as it develops through to its final iteration. I think that's a subject we'll return to in that. It's being published in February. Yeah, we'll yeah. hopefully we can return to that quite soon. Let's move on to Brexit. So, do you want to wrap that up? Sorry, my apologies. No, thank you, convener. I just got a, a couple of final questions around land reform, and can I refer to my register of interest as the owner of a um, land holding in the Highlands? Um, the land reform budget is at 17.1 million uh, for the coming year. And my questions are, are twofold. Firstly, around the Scottish Land Fund. Am I right in thinking that um, the uh, government intends to um, match its commitment last year of £10 million to the Scottish Land Fund? And um, in, res in relation to that, is there money left over from last year um, in, re in terms of the Scottish Land Fund? Um, Am I right in thinking? Me if money is rolled over, if it's unspent? Yes. The answer, I'm afraid, is no, because we're in one year budgeting. So, 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 so am I right in thinking, the Scot are you able to put a figure, and I understand if you're not, on what the Scottish Land Fund will sit at um, this well, year? Well, I, I can't. I mean, by the, I, I mean, I could make a wild guess, uh, uh, but by the end of March, I think about... 70% of it will have been spent. Um, uh, but, um, as I indicated, the, the no 10 right. million will be renewed. Um, I mean, it's difficult. It's a demand-led budget. It's not a, it, you know, it's, it's, we, we rely on the applications. I totally yeah. appreciate that. And there may be a lot of reasons why there, why, why, why there haven't been applications. Mm. But, Sorry, but, can, I, can I just be clear? Was that 70% spent or committed? We, excuse me, we could, to be spent, I um, think. 
we could provide details to the committee. Um, it's, it's a combination of the two. two there are right. at least two further committee right. rounds to be held. Um, there are projects in the pipeline. Um, when those decisions are taken, I think we'll be at the sort of 70-80% <coughs> right. spend in terms of awards having been made. Um, there are one or two potential awards which we haven't made a decision on yet, so it, it could even be fully spent. Yeah. Or it may be 70, 80 percent. It it, yeah. it just depends. Yeah, it's just it, to get that on it's the record. It's a little difficult, and um, I mean, for obvious reasons, because it's demand-led. Also, you know, you can now give pre-acquisition support as well. So there's 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 a little bit. It's a little bit kind of awkward. Um, uh, but the the you know, I'm I'm really pleased that the 10 million is is going to be repeated for the next year. I think we all are, given its importance yeah. to, to communities across Scotland. Um, can I just ask about the um, extra 3.4 million uh, in the budget, sort of excluding the, the land fund? Uh, mm -hmm. And just to, I think you referred to it in your opening comments. Where is that money destined? Three and a half million going to uh, um, build the register of controlling interests. So, so that is purely for, 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 yeah. for that? Okay. Yeah. And the Scottish Land Commission, um, <coughs> that money has been used and spent, presumably. We're not, there's no, is there any budget no, to they, spend? No, they not, not kind of so significant as to, as so to the, the, issues the, there. That's a continuing. Yeah, so the budget for 1819 um, for the Scottish Land Commission is the same as this year, 1.4 million. Um, the land fund stays at 10 million. Um, there's some other money within that fund for uh, programme and staffing costs, uh, and then the additional three and a half million is capital. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to Brexit, uh, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and, and officials. We've obviously touched on Brexit, which is obviously the sort of ghost to every feast from our taking um, evidence. Um, I'm particularly interested um, on looking at the impact that European funding has had. Um, if I can give you an example from the last time we took evidence from SNH, um, the EU funding in global terms is around 57 million, made up, as you know, Cabinet Secretary from Life Plus, ERDF, and SR, uh, SRDP. That's obviously a very considerable uh, sum of money. The overall position obviously is dependent on the negotiation, but there is a general view that funding should be repatriated back uh, to UK and to Scottish governments. What sort of plans have you got to, uh, uh, what plans are involving to make up? the loss of this funding in the future when we completely withdraw from the EU? Um, well, right at the moment, it's very difficult to see how, how it can be replaced unless the Westminster government is prepared to effectively continue the same level of funding that has been received um, previously. Um, and that's, you know, I, I would imagine... Um, will be challenging um, and and therefore we are uncertain as to what how much of it might come one has to presume that a certain percentage will come whether or not all of it will is another matter entirely um, and um, there then is a question over how one makes up whatever gap there is now you know, in different areas, there may be different opportunities. So, you know, some of the research providers might be able to look for funding sources beyond y Europe um, and and try and develop um, uh, uh, streams of funding from elsewhere. So there are there are you know in a each of the kind of areas within the portfolio there might be potential there might be potential for um, making up some shortfall. Um, but it's going to be a significant loss. And at the moment, there is no immediately obvious way um, of understanding what, what will take its place. The question of agencies about European funding is, um, do you have effectively a risk register? And if you lose this funding, is that effectively something that's highlighted? And the general answer, as you will know, is that yes, this is an area of risk and an area of concern. I, I think have. everybody who, um, you know, whether it's um, within my portfolio area or other portfolio areas, is very, very conscious indeed of the extent to which yeah. um, much of the work that happens happens because of European funding. Mm. Um, and um, while 
you know, we can continue to do the match funding part, the bit that's the European funding part, mm. at the moment there is a big question mark around mm. it. Mm. Um, uh, as I indicated, I mean, I would expect there is going to be some kind of financial settlement um, post-Brexit that, that operates on some form of, uh, of, uh, uh, of mm. allocation. Mm. But I think everybody needs to remember that Scotland has benefited mm. disproportionately mm. Um, uh, from European funding. Mm. Um, and unless that disproportionate benefit is maintained, then we will see mm. um, a shortfall. Yeah, and as the Cabinet Secretary knows, that, that's part of the design of the structural funds. The old Objective 1 funding, for example, was to bring up the regional spend to the European average above 75%. So that was what the, that's what the European structural funds were designed to do, the, the lagging regions such as mine and Highlands and Islands. Uh, it was stimu to stimulate their GDP. Can I move you on to another... Uh, Sorry, can we example sorry, uh, of this. Zero Waste Scotland, if I recall, kind of restructured itself a few years ago to draw down a very large proportion of European funding. Am I right in saying that whilst the Scottish Government gives £20.5 to Zero Waste Scotland, it actually gets more than that from EU sources? Um, Maybe I'm recalling that incorrectly, but that... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, do you want to say something on yeah. that, Neil? Uh, sorry, I apologise. I'm not an expert on the uh, zero waste side of the house, but yes, uh, through the uh, uh, Circular Economy Investment Fund, uh, they draw down funding from the European Regional Development Fund. Yeah, so the impact on, on them would be even more pronounced than it would be on some other sectors. It will vary depending yeah. on the sectors. I mean, I think it won't be the same in yeah. every sector, but there will be aspects of what we do, both in this portfolio and specifically in the rural economy portfolio, um, that will be very significantly impacted. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry, David. Can we move on to another area, Cabinet Secretary, that we do know a little bit more about, and that's the European Court uh, of Justice, as you'll well know, um, that's the Environmental Court of Last Resort. Now, we know the UK government uh, is very clear that they wish to withdraw from that, and you'll know, Cabinet Secretary, that Michael Gove wrote to the committee, saying, uh, recently saying, and I'm quoting, I set out plans to consult on a new independent and statutory body to hold government to account on environmental commitments. He also made it quite clear uh, that the devolved uh, parliaments, both here in Northern Ireland and in Wales, would obviously have to set their own bodies up. I mean, have you a plan um, to set up a, a Scottish Environmental Court of last resort or use existing court structure uh, to make sure we can enforce environmental legislation in Scotland once we withdraw from the ECJ? There's no um, current plan to set up a formal court. Um, there are, however, discussions beginning um, in respect of how we manage environmental accountability, um, you know, which is a kind of the, the, the sort of broader area within which this, um, which this sits. Um, uh, you may be aware that um, there is going to be a UK government consultation, um, but that's for England, and uh, it is for the devolved authorities to try and work out how best they wish to do this, and we have started this conversation uh, in Scotland as well. Um, uh, I'm, I'll be watching with interest what the south of the border consultation looks like. I haven't seen a draft of it yet. Um, but yes, we are looking at the, um, the requirements of environmental governance um, post-Brexit. And to, to be honest, I thought Michael Gove's point was actually a good one to consult on a body to keep uh, the effectively England uh, environmental legislation to account. I mean, is there a scenario that you could uh, you could utilise the court of session as being uh, a court which would take over responsibilities of the ECJ once, once we withdraw, in the sense that would put it on a, a stronger legal footing as it currently is? Well, I, I think if we could just separate out a couple of things, because environmental governments doesn't necessarily mean a court, and a court isn't necessarily going to do all of the things that uh, um, an accountability body might choose to do. Um, uh, so I, I think the, the, it would be wrong, I think, to see the two things as being the same. Um, I, I think Michael Gove, was it, I don't know if it was Michael Gove, 
or Theresa Coffey used the analogy of the Committee on Climate Change for the environmental accountability body that they were talking about, which I was slightly surprised at because I don't necessarily think we regard the Committee on Climate Change as a body that, that would hold you accountable um, when clearly there was a kind of sense that this would have a more, I hesitate to use the word regulatory, but have a more directive function than the Committee in, uh, for Climate Change. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, but we are considering, as is Wales and I presume Northern Ireland, um, uh, what will be required in terms of governance afterwards. Um, and I wouldn't want to rule anything out, but neither would I want to say um, at this point specifically what we choose to do, because you know the, the court structures are very distinctive, quite separate, and um, uh, and um, uh, um, allocating to them that responsibility would take quite a deal of thinking, um, thinking it through. Can I move on to Marine Scotland and maybe uh, Mr Black's best place to answer uh, my, ne my next question. Um, could I raise issues, uh, Mr Black, around science, data and compliance? You'll know that the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund provides um, over 30 million to Marine Scotland for this very important work. What, what proportion um, of your spend in science, data and compliance um, uh, is made up of that uh, uh, EMFF uh, funding? Yeah, I, I gave you... My estimate at the moment is it's about four and a half million. I mean, that's in, in, in rough terms, four and a half million out of, so it's about 11% of the overall expenditure. It's quite a significant amount. We, you know, it has to be said, a lot of our science and a lot of our compliance activity is funded via European funding at the moment. So it is something that we have highlighted to the UK government as a, as a, as a, as a key area for ourselves. <laughs> and that, of course, is to maintain the levels at, at where we are now. And of course, until we have a, a full picture of exactly what the, mm. the, the future picture on fisheries policy is going to be, we, we, we don't know exactly what our compliance activities, yeah. for example, might, might actually be. So it is a, it is a significant... So, significant so in simple terms, it's a huge chunk of your science it is. budget. It is. I mean, have, have you effectively got a risk register as well? If you yes. lose that funding, alarm bells ring, basically. Yes, we have our risk register, and this is, this is high on it, and, and it's been one of the, the points that have the Scottish Government has made very regularly to the UK Government, it's not just in the marine context but in other contexts as well, that, uh, that this would have a, a significant impact if, if there wasn't replacement funding. And on your uh, evidence uh, to us, you, you make the reasonable point that that funding from Europe gives you a cutting edge on conservation measures for fishing. What concerns do you have if you lost that funding about still being at the cutting edge in Scotland? Will we lose our place in, in that? Well, obviously, if, whichever funding we have, we will make, make best use of it as we possibly can. But you are right. We do consider ourselves right at the forefront of, of uh, maintaining a, a, a cutting edge approach, which will enable us to maintain the good fishing that we have, but also make sure it's environmentally um, sustainable in the long run as well. Uh, we will obviously always try and prioritise that as far as we can. But if there is a big hole in the funding, then that, that must have an impact. So we would, we would rather be at the cutting edge and developing things ourselves uh, rather than following others. Mm. Um, but that is part of the planning. I think is, is, is mm. I, I think I mentioned before at the, uh, when, when, I, when I came mm. here before that one of the things we are looking at and that we'll be discussing with ministers is, is the possibility of charging. Uh, which again is one of the, the, the options available, but it's not it's not the sole option available. Really, what, mm. what we're looking for is this funding to be to be replaced. Yeah, and is there any other? If I'm conscious of time coming. Is there any other funding uh, that you don't constantly access that you may be able to use as a substitute? I think we are definitely going to be actively looking to see whether mm. we can work with other bodies to actually make sure we, not only that we <coughs> maximise the amount of funding, but that we, we get the best value for money out of the funding mm. we have, so that if we look across Scotland as a whole, it's not just Marine Scotland that's involved in, in uh, investment in the science in, in this area, that we try and work with others to try and make sure that we get the best yeah. from the, the whole pot of money. Right, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, On um, charging, Claudia Beamish, and then Stuart Stevenson. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I, I wonder if I could ask you, Cabinet Secretary, what your view is on uh, the possibility of Marine Scotland introducing a charging regime to, um, uh, or, or just really, if you have any comment on that. Well, I mean, charging is uh, uh, something which, uh, to be fair, it's not just Marine Scotland who are involved in this conversation. I think CPA are also 
um, looking at the um, charging uh, the, the charging issue. Um, there, there is um, uh, uh, some real uh, uh, consideration taking place. Ultimately, I think I get the final sign-off on any potential charging regime. But I haven't, I mean, the, the, it's a very early stage in terms of uh, uh, talking uh, both within the organisations and to relevant stakeholders how that might best be managed. So I haven't seen uh, a draft charging scheme as yet, although I would expect to see one. I mean, I don't know what the timescale is for Marine Scotland's. We're, we're certainly accelerating that timescale and trying to make it as, as quick as possible. I think one of the things we are aware of is that we do have to make sure that stakeholders have involvement in all that, and also that we want to look across the whole piece, because if, if you look at charging for all the different activities that, that, that take place, you could have a cumulative impact on, on particular areas that you, you might not want. So it's quite mm. important to look at it you know, holistically rather than in, in little chunks. Can I just pick up that point before Corey Beamish comes back, Cabinet Secretary? Um, when it does come to sign off, uh, amongst the factors that you will consider, would that include the ability of a sector to carry any increase in its costs. I'm thinking particularly of agriculture at the moment. SEPA are looking at abstraction license mm. increases, which I suspect will come up across your desk before too long, at a time when agriculture is having a pretty difficult uh, time of it. So would a consideration for you be whether a sector can bear a substantial increase in costs? I would expect that to be part of what comes to me, a, a, a clear understanding uh, on the part of Marine Scotland and SEPA that um, that has to be taken as an issue. Um, and I, I need to be clear, as I understand it, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, that the charging is about cost recovery. It's not actually about making money. I, th I think I'm right in, in, in saying it is about, you know, cost recovery, which is, um, uh, which is slightly different to charging in order to... Uh, 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 maximise a financial benefit out of it. Um, but clearly, and, and Graham's already flagged up, that I would have thought that, particularly for Marine Scotland, they would need to have a very clear conversation with SEPA at an absolute minimum about where the charges are likely to apply um, and, uh, and will that you know, overburden some people. But all of that, I would, I would, I would expect that it wouldn't be for me to have to... to I think that they should be looking at that uh, as, a, uh, uh, as part of the process. So if they aren't already, I hope that they are <laughs> listening to what I'm saying, that, 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 that that's got to be an issue. Thank you. Just for getting that on the record, uh, Claudia Beamish. Right. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, could I ask another question about Marine um, Scotland and, and that budget as we're, we're looking at that at the moment? Um, and I'd like to know... Uh, from the Cabinet Secretary and also from uh, Graham Black, whether you both um, consider that the national indicator associated with uh, Marine Scotland is perhaps unduly narrow um, in view of the fact that there's a lot of focus on fisheries and uh, perhaps not as much as, as I would hope would be on environment. And I wonder if you could say a little more about that. That, that is um, narrow and um, we are looking at... Um, uh, changing that and including a broader range of activities because it is it is very singularly focused. Um, so that that will uh, hasn't fed through yet to the national performance framework, but it will do. And it will include biodiversity and also the cleanliness of our waters as, mm -hmm. as well as the economic fisheries aspect. So it, 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 I think it will give a much better overall picture of of what we're doing around the seas of, around Scotland rather than concentrating on that rather narrow one that you mentioned. And, and in view of the fact that that is being reviewed, as I understand at the moment, will that be something that could be in this, um, in this process rather than having to wait for the next review? I, I, I think it's, to, to me, it's as, as soon as we have our measures that we think mm. are appropriate, we would, we would share that more widely and see what, you know, again, we would like some input from others outside Marine Scotland to see whether they think it's, it's appropriate. But I think you can, what we're doing at the moment is trying to work out exactly underpinning that, what measures would actually make sense in order to measure the, 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 the health of our seas. And, and, and that's not always, 
it's not always clear cut. We don't want it overly complex. We don't want it overly simple. But we, ha we have to understand the underlying measures that will go into towards that, and we will we'll be bringing that forward as soon as we've done a little, little bit. Can, more can you give any time scale on that? It will certainly be next it. year. Uh, right. I, I think it's, it's just a question of prioritising that in amongst all the, the other discussions around things like Brexit, etc. Right. That, that, so if it's not ready for this iteration of the national performance framework. Um, I would ask you if, if you could clarify for us if it would be possible to, um, to have that as, as part of your, your aims, even if it wasn't in the national performance framework, if, the, if indeed you arrive at a, yeah. a, an alteration to, your, your, um, to the uh, indicators. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy with that. And I, I think as far as we're concerned, we've already done a lot of work and now we need to actually just have a, a wider discussion about it. So I, I, it's not something that's in the long, very long term. I think it's something we can move quite quickly. And obviously that has budgetary implications, just to get back to the point of the, of the session. Yeah. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, Stuart Stevens and then Mark Roscoe. Um, in relation to the UK government minister's comments about uh, the a UK-wide environmental body and reference to the UK Climate Change Committee, is that not a very useful uh, comparison that UK governments are, ministers are making in that the UK Climate Change Committee requires the agreement of all four jurisdictions to any material action in that committee and that any of the nations uh, can veto the decisions of the other three. And therefore, if that is the model that is being proposed uh, for uh, bodies that affect uh, all four uh, jurisdictions in the UK, it has in that particular respect some uh, advantageous aspects. I, I think that's a fair point, although that's not, as you would imagine, is not how it's being expressed currently. Um, the, the, the reference to the UK Committee on Climate Change um, uh, was about the advisory nature of it um, and the fact that we were all kind of signed up to it. But of course, the UK Committee for Climate Change doesn't have the, 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 the other additional things that this proposed environmental accountability body would, because this environmental accountability body is actually you know, going to act as a, as a conduit for um, complaints and compliance. Um, so that brings into play, at least that's what they're consulting on, so that brings into play a whole different set of questions, um, which I'm suspecting we might not be the only devolved authority to begin to think, well, hang on a sec, how is that going to be um, set up? Um, it is a fair point, however, if, if the proposal is that you, there is a kind of four-way equal say, if that's built into a process, any process, then, then, uh, uh, then, you know, you would have to look at that and consider whether it was appropriate. I'm not at the moment feeling that that's quite where this is at. I may be wrong, but that's not how it was being described. Well, alternatively, it might be the previous model of the British Waterways Board, where the Scottish Minister had to sign off actions that British Waterways took in England. <laughs> right, OK. I speak I, from experience. Right. <laughs> well, I, I, yes, I don't know that anybody would regard that as being a particularly helpful way forward for anybody. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's, uh, you know, it's indicative of where we are, that this is all really a, a current conversation. Um, and um, as I indicated, once the draft consultation published for England... Um, comes out, you'll see the nature of the body that is being talked about. But the nature of the body is such that it was quite, it's quite clearly intended to have a compliance role um, and that people would be able to make formal complaints to it. Um, now, I would be a little bit uncomfortable if that was happening cross-border. Mark Roscoe. Just go back to the issue of Marine Scotland's key indicator again. Um, I mean, I hear the comments made about, you know, potentially reforming that and broadening the range of indicators out. But in terms of the indicator you've got at the moment, it is flatlining, um, despite the fact that budgets have been increased since 2014-15. So what are, the, what are the reasons and the challenges around that? Um, well, I, I don't want to speak for Graham, but I would have uh, uh, presumed that um, the indicator um, 
isn't directly related to the budget because some of the decision making around the commercial fisheries is out with our our control so we're not you know we're not in control of all of that that's uh, um, uh, that that's a, a, a difficulty um, and, uh, and and I suppose the lack of indicators in other areas means you know we we've got uh, um, uh, we've got budget and we've got progress in other areas. This one area being the only one in the in the you know the only one that's an indicator, I, I think, is a slightly distorted picture of what Marine Scotland is and is not doing. Graham, I don't know whether you want to yeah, come I mean, in. Obviously, there are quite long time lags uh, in terms of the indicator between what you do and having any impact on on the indicator, particularly when it's uh, as crude as it is now. I think the the budget position is. It's not quite as simple as it, as it looks. Uh, uh, there, were, there were changes in the way in which the Scottish Government dealt with central uh, funding of, of services, which actually, so what appears to be an increase in the budget actually was an increase in the budget to cover centralised costs, if you know what I mean. So actually, the, the, the budget's been, been more or less flat rather than actually actually increasing. So it's a slightly misleading picture when you just look at the, 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 the numbers. Um, but overall, I would say the to me, the key point is having good indicators that, in, that tell us not only what, are, what is Marine Scotland doing now, but what are the long-term trends in terms of, of, of our fish stocks, of the health of our seas, of, of, of all those aspects, the biodiversity. They're not things that you can sort of switch like switches on and off. They do take a long while, and that's why we have to have something that gives us a much longer time frame so that we understand uh, the impact of what we're doing and we can understand where we need to, to take immediate attention. It may, not it may be three or four or five or ten years hence that we actually see the impact, but at least we'll know that, uh, that whatever uh, levers we've got we're pulling are, are heading in the right direction. OK, uh, let's move this on. Um, last year, the Scottish Government was praised for directing £10 million pounds to peatland restoration, £2 million pounds from your budget heading cabinet secretary, I think eight million pounds from Fergus Ewings. But now we move to a point where the target for people and restoration goes from ten thousand hectares a year to twenty thousand hectares, and yet we're seeing a forty percent cut in the budget for people and restoration. Um, can you tell us what the rationale for that cut is and how you think we'll manage to achieve these new targets with substantially less funding to support them? Peatland is one of the areas that I think will become an increasing challenge um, for us, um, uh, and you know is is one where I'm, um, you know, anxious to ensure that we uh, uh, don't um, allow things to to slip back. Um, the portfolio itself continues to contribute two million, so that is the same as the previous year. The eight million extra that came in last year, and I remember this was the subject of some exchanges because people were, it comes from another budget, was because SRDP money was identified. So this year, um, we've not been able to identify eight million, we've only been able to identify four million. So it, 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 last year's eight million was a kind of in-year um, uh, um, allocation as opposed to you know, part of the kind of overall budget. So this year, it doesn't look like eight million is going to be possible. It'll be four million, and it goes back to the issues that David Stewart was raising about SRDP, um, uh, how one plugs that gap as that gradually begins to um, uh, uh, tail off. So there are some significant challenges around that. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to work very hard to ensure um, and make sure that all of this money does get spent. Because I don't think all of last year's, all of the 17-18 budget, sorry, I kind of lose, uh, is, you know, be the same issue as the land fund because you're, you've, you know, you, you're, again, it's, it's demand-led, it's... it's um, uh, you know, capacity to actually do the work. There's some issues around, you know, the, 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 the skills and the ability to do the work and some of the projects take a while to get going. Um, so making sure that what money is allocated <coughs> is all spent in the right way is, is going to become increasingly important. So, so from your perspective, if money were to become available, would this be a priority area for you, given that the SNH chief executive indicated last week that there's a considerable pipeline of projects and that they essentially could use the money? I, I, 
I, this would be one of those areas that I would be anxious not just to preserve where we are, but to try and increase the amount that could be spent. So if there was money identified that I was able to um, allocate to this, this would be one of those areas where I would. Now, it's not the only one, because there are pressures that come from other parts of the portfolio, including, for example, flooding. So, you know, you, you, you would have to um, um, think about it very carefully. But this is one of the areas that, in the longer term, I have some anxiety about. Over a period of time, and repeatedly, we've heard that as public money is invested in this, so it would encourage funding from other sources, not just European, perhaps private money, pension funds, that type of thing. Is there any work going on to try and uh, identify such sources to support people in restoration? I don't think we've been able to do that yet. Um, uh, Neil, do you, are you aware of any progress on that front? Yeah. Not in terms of pension funds, but some of the work that SNH has been doing through Peatland Action has been to look at uh, potential synergies with the, the Peatland Code, which is a mechanism for levering investment uh, from the private sector. Uh, and so that is something we will continue to look at. OK, thanks. OK, moving this on, then, the, there's a substantial scale of reduction in funding to support emission, uh, emission reduction from the agricultural sector, given that the agricultural sector is so problematic. Um, what's the justification for that? Where is this? Just give me a second. Do you have the, <laughs> the kind of irrelevant stuff? Um, Are you taking this from the... So, so there are two, two um, figures, essentially. There's a reduction in funding to support emissions reductions from 8.3 million in 2017-18 to 4.6 million in the draft budget. And the budget attached to public good advisory service is set to reduce from 6.5 million to 3.2 million. Um, yeah. I think... There was a reason for some of the public good reduction. If you just give me two secs while I try and find my section that is related to agriculture. Sorry, I thought I had it. I thought I had it better labelled. Where are some of the where is some of the stuff? Ah, is that where it is? Sorry. <laughs> too well organised. I've got too many bits of paper, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, right, OK, yeah. I, I, the, 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 there's, there's been... Some part of it is to avoid double counting. So there's been an issue around uh, support for the and this is the overall agricultural budget, the support for peatland restoration through the land manager's renewable fund has been classified under land use, so there's a bit of changing around in technical terms. Um, uh, the, the, uh, some of the other work was deemed to be a high cost, but was delivering low mitigation potential. Um, and uh, um, not felt to be um, as of much, uh, as great a value as was originally thought. Um, the, there was, for example, an expensive proposal put forward um, which had a potential abatement of just 19,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. So, so the sum of it has been pulled back because what was being, what was being looked at wasn't actually going to deliver um, what, we, what we thought. Um, now, I thought I saw something separate about the public good issue. Um, I, I know there were two or three things that were that were creating. I don't know what the hell. Yeah, happened. If I can help, Cabinet um, Secretary, the, the public goods budget has gone down from 6.5 million to 3.2 million. Um, I think we'd be seeking an explanation of that as well. Maybe that's what you're coming to. Well, I, yeah, that's what I'm trying to... I mean... Uh, sorry, I have, I have got it here somewhere and I can't find the, 
the 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 explanation. So I'll need to I'll need to come back on that. If you could come back on it, because yeah, it's, it's a fairly I, substantial I know I have budget it, I, reduction. I know I have it here. There was there was some there was some very significant reasons. It wasn't just a we're slashing the budget. It, the, there was some actual kind of concrete decision making okay. um, behind it. I shall probably find it at a completely inappropriate moment in the middle of another question. Okay. But, uh... Mark Roscoe wants to come in on this. <laughs> Can I just expand this a little into the, the SRDP, which you've already mentioned, Cabinet Secretary? I'm just wondering what your level of influence is on the SRDP budget, because we've seen 42 million cut from the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme. Now, on face value, that's something which clearly may impact on policies to reduce carbon emissions across the board. So I'm wondering kind of how this works in terms of budget setting and, and choices in terms of the cabinet and in particular the SRDP budget, which has seen a number of cuts which are relevant to the achievement of objectives in your portfolio. Um, yeah, there have been some significant issues with some of the, some of the particular schemes in the last year. And I think IX was one of them. Um, so that's not, wasn't really a kind of cut in the, I mean, it was a, it was a difficulty with the, with the programme um, uh, there. Um, uh, I mean, I, I mean I, I'm responsible for my portfolio budget. There are some conversations that are being had across portfolios about um, uh, the interaction um, uh, between portfolios, um, but at the end of the day, um, it's not for me to step into somebody else's portfolio and direct them as to how they make their decisions or otherwise. Um, there is a process by which we do um, uh, uh, some negotiating backwards and forwards, and, and uh, um, I'm trying to think if it was IX or one of the other ones where the, the money that was um, then available was allocated to other other programs, a number of which did help us. So they weren't badged under, you know, it, it, it's it's, and that was part of the conversation. So they weren't badged under, for example, IX any longer. But they were there was still money being directed towards the, you know, from our perspective, appropriate end. Um, well, I, I think I'll need to ask Fergus Ewing to write to you with yes. more detail about that. I think that would be a fairer way to do it because because it's it's at the end of the day um, uh, decision making that he has to make and he has as many challenges and 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 pressures on his budget as we all do. Well, that would be of interest if you could get him to write to us on that, okay. uh, John Scott. And just clearing an interest on that subject particularly. I mean, there has been difficulties um, accessing, as you said, that IX budget uh, right across Scotland. Um, huge difficulties of complexity and, I think, funding as well. And if the Cabinet Secretary, yourself, uh, in that joint response, if you could address those difficulties, be very grateful. And, and hope, a hope for improvement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm conscious that there were some very particular issues over a couple of the badged um, um, funding uh, mechanisms. Um, and the decisions that were then made after that were to redirect what was available to different um, schemes. Um, and we were involved in the conversation about where that would go. But it was understanding that, that some of them were causing such difficulties as they really couldn't any longer um, be used. OK. Yep. Right, thank you. Um, Finlay Carson. Good evening. I'd, I'd like to, to move uh, on to SNH. <coughs> uh, <coughs> beg your pardon. Uh, the relevant national indicators that uh, uh, SNH work with uh, are to improve access to local green space, increase people's use of Scotland's outdoors, improve the condition of protected nature sites and increased abundance of terrestrial breeding birds. Uh, in a previous evidence session, SNH have said that they're reprioritising um, to meet the new ambition of the corporate plan through greater emphasis on uh, making places more available to disadvantaged communities. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether she's content with the, the shift in SNH's approach and uh, does she think that 
uh, whether these uh, improvements uh, or changes will improve the, the indicators for access to, to local green space. And at the same time, could you give us an indication whether you think that this change um, will have implications towards existing priorities, for example, uh, deer and, uh, and beaver management? The answer to the last part of the question is no, it won't, because I will be absolutely clear with SNH that these are pretty fundamental things that have to be, uh, um, have to be continued. Um, I, th I think what committee members need to, re to remember is that there's a relatively new chair and a new chief executive, um, and they're keen, I think, to, um, uh, um, how would I put it, reprofile the SNH. Um, uh, and I think part of what you're hearing is that desire to have SNH um, understood better by the public. Um, and it's translating um, through into uh, the, the language that you're talking about. But I would not want that in any way to diminish the, the, the work that they need to do on what might be called the, the more nuts and bol bolts part of their, of their, of their job. Um, and I've made it pretty clear to them that things like deer management, etc., are are fundamental. But I, I think that w what you're seeing is the desire of a new um, management to to um, to perhaps have SNH understood better by the public. There's a feeling that most people don't really know what SNH does or or what it's about. Um, so some of this is about about that um, um, that aspect. Okay, given that, um, are are you content that the the, the national indicators uh, relating to the condition of protected uh, nature sites and abundance of terrestrial breeding birds, which are currently flatlining, do you think their new approach will actually uh, start to show improvements in, in these indicators? hope so, because actually, if, if part of the issue is SNH not really having a particularly strong profile and understanding amongst, you know, members of the public, a better engagement with the public is going to have really good spin-off for a number of these things, uh, um, because people will have a better and clearer understanding of what it is that, that is being done and why. Um, uh, and, and so I would see those two things as potentially having a positive dynamic. Um, I, I think, um, uh, you know, I, d I don't think there's any desire on the part of anybody in SNH to, um, uh, uh, to, make things, uh, to make things worse. What they want to do is actually to achieve better than they've been achieving. And I would very much want to encourage them in that. And that will include across those indicators that are basically remaining, you could say flatlining, we might just say remaining at a sort of stable level, but they're not going down. Um, but there will be some indicators that that's, you know, where, where, where we, we might be seen to be falling back, in which case I would want those turned around. I mean, th these are all things that we expect SNH to do. But, we, we've but seen with it, perhaps we, better engagement. Yeah, we, might we've help. seen a 13% reduction in funding since 1415. Uh, do you think that's contributed to those national indicators, as, as I described them, flatlining? You're describing them staying the same. I suppose it's the same, same <laughs> thing, really. Um, do you think we need further investment to, to start to show an improvement? Because I don't think the status quo is really what we're looking for. We want to see improvements in habitats and... Absolutely. And, you know, if, if, if I could identify um, uh, an, uh, 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 an easy source of further um, uh, money, then I would very much want to do so. Um, so if during the committee's deliberations you can identify within my broad portfolio budget um, uh, a place from which to shift money into SNH, then, then you know... I'd be interested to hear it. Um, I'm not myself able to see it very easily. Um, so uh, like everybody else, SNH, SEPA, Marine Scotland, they all have to learn to live within the budget that they have. Um, I don't think that the, I don't think 
there is a direct relationship between the budget and the performance indicators. I think there are there's still some um, work needs to be done in places like SEPA to uh, ensure that the money is being spent properly and wisely. I'm concerned that uh, the, the new approach by SNH will tick the boxes of getting more children into the countryside and whatever, but I, I'm not convinced that it will actually re return improvements in these indicators. Are you confident that these changes will actually achieve that in light of the, the, the funding cuts? <coughs> It's not the changes on their own. It's it's what that means in terms of uh, of engagement. It's what it means in terms of um, uh, SNH um, uh, taking a much more outward face. After all, they will be judged by these indicators by the very people that they are trying to further engage. So yes, I do think that those two things um, uh, uh, will help one another. Um, will they will they achieve that overnight? Uh, I wouldn't have thought so because these things take time, particularly when we're dealing with nature, which SNH is, of course. So you don't get overnight success. But I think that that will help turn it round, yes. Thank you. Do, do you want to come in? Keith, Keith looks like he wants to come in. Convener, if I could just, just add a brief comment. I think you heard from uh, Mr. Seska last week uh, when you challenged her on is this a fundamental shift in, in priorities? Um, and, and her answer was that they would continue to do the other things as well. So there's a, there's a bit of a change in emphasis, but not a fundamental um, switching off of some work to be replaced with other. And, and uh, the chief exec said that she would continue to do the other work as well. OK, uh, let's move this on briefly to look at SEPA. And I think we began to touch on this as well, because SEPA has also had a reduction in funding, um, which I'm sure you would say hasn't contributed to lack of progress in their relevant national uh, indicators. But I would ask the question in a slightly different way. Um, would there not need, to, or might there need to be greater investment to ensure that these indicators start to show improvement? Well, you know, I, I think I've indicated with response to, you know, the question about SNH, that if, if I lived in the world where one could simply increase investment across the board, then of course I would want to do so. Um, there, you know, there are probably um, uh, uh, many, many areas where, uh, uh, where that would be um, an ideal scenario, but we're not in that scenario. Um, uh, we're in a scenario where um, we have to think very carefully about um, how the money is being spent and how best we achieve what we want to achieve from it. And of course, SEPA is one of the um, one of the bodies that's also looking at um, uh, potential further potential charging um, uh, issues. Um, so you know they will be uh, um, hoping to find some other ways to offset the um, uh, uh, the what might be perceived as a as a cut. But I can't you know from within the budget I can't see where to take this from um, if I'm to substantially increase SNH and SEPA budgets, how I, choose, how I do that without substantially decreasing other parts of the portfolio budget. This is well, in fairness, there are issues around indicators being impacted by circumstances out with the control of government. For example, around waste, we're heavily dependent on local authorities to deliver in that area and that performance hasn't been what you would have wanted. And around renewable electricity generation, we've had the unhelpful intervention on offshore wind. Um, unhelpful intervention of what, offshore wind? Um, a legal challenge. That oh, the, I'm sorry, yeah. yes, OK. Um, uh, yeah, but, 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 but all of the indicators, I mean, these are national performance indicators, and they will each of them be impacted by a number of things. I mean, I think Graham referred to, you know, not, you know, the indicator that currently exists for... Um, effectively for Marine Scotland is impacted by decisions made about, you know, total allowable catch, which are not decisions that we are actually making. So, yes, that applies to all indicators. And climate change itself, of course, will impact on some of the indicators. Um, uh, and, and we need to um, uh, understand that. I mean, some, some of the indicators will... 
um, will be, unless climate change is thrown into reverse, we're going to see some impacts um, and those impacts will play through into uh, indicators. We already covered the Brexit subject quite extensively, but just in relation to the Circular Economy Investment Fund and funding from ERDF, um, what discussions have you had around uh, that issue? Um, uh, I've not had uh, um, myself um, specific discussions about this. I know that there are um, some conversations taking place, and I think the reference in the earlier part of the evidence in respect to zero waste and where they get much of their money um, from. Um, but, but the decisions about that um, are, are also decisions that will be impacted by decisions made at the Westminster level. So uh, I've, I've had a difficult time trying to get environment pushed further up the agenda in terms of these talks. Um, we've now got it onto the agenda, but there are a number of aspects there that still have to be um, thought through. And the circular economy um, side of things is, is definitely one that will be part of that um, conversation. Um, and I'm hopeful that some of the things that Michael Gove has said around some aspects of this, I'm hopeful that that there will be a productive conversation when we can get to it. OK, uh, moving on, uh, Mark Roscoe. I think we've, think we've okay. covered the particular aspect. Okay. I did have another question about okay, come in which I'll come in at this stage on. Um, it was to refer back to a previous piece of evidence actually we had from Marine Scotland, um, where there was a discussion about uh, the rollout of you know, a future uh, for MPAs uh, to complete the network that was uh, suggested by SNH three years ago. And I think we had evidence that suggested that there could be a resourcing issue there in terms of uh, working on the management measures for the existing MPAs, but also rolling out new MPAs. And I think a figure was put on it that it might require an extra one to two members of staff. Um, so I, I think Marine Scotland's going to come back to some more detail. I wondered if there was more reflection on that today and whether it's possible for us to do two things at once, support the existing management of MPAs while working on completing the network. Okay. Um, yes, I, I, I think that, that my colleague was maybe being a little on the cautious side when he said it'd be one or two members of staff. I, I, I think we're absolutely keen to press ahead as quickly as we can, but as has been said before, we're, we're balancing this along all the other um, priorities that we have to, to, to manage. So I don't think we're talking about something that's knocking into the long grass. We're just talking about how much resource we can re re release in over a busy period where, for example, over the next six months, we know Brexit is going to take up a lot of, uh, of our time and attention as well. So uh, we will put as much resource as we can into MPAs. Um, we want to expect to extend the network and make sure that it's working the right way. And we've got the uh, the existing MPA network working to the best effect. So I don't think we're talking about anything fundamental. It's just, it's just a question that it's just, I, I think we were just wanted to, to, to recognise the fact that there are resource pressures that, that perhaps stop everything going as fast as we would ideally like, but it's still very high on our agenda. Have you got time scales for that then? Uh, no, no, I, I wouldn't say it at this we stage. Have to wait I, I, until I, we, it's finished first. Yeah, I, I mean, we will, we, if, if you're happy, I'm, I, I'm happy to write with a little bit more detail over what our plans are around that, if that, if that would help the committee. Uh, that'd but be, I, that'd be useful. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's uh, develop the MPA theme, Angus MacDonald. Yes, um, Convener, good morning to the Cabinet Secretary and, and the, the officials. Um, clearly, um, Mr. Black's just stated that, you know, Marine Scotland can always use more resources. Uh, to ensure um, compliance, with, particularly with regard to, to MPAs. Uh, meantime, it would seem that we are uh, relying on and promoting a, a culture of a culture of compliance. Um, now, we're aware of an, an FOI uh, which is reported or was reported in the Times that there's been uh, 78 reports of suspected incursions inside MPA boundaries between 2015 and 2017, May 2017, uh, but only one conviction secured. Um, do you consider that the, the, the promotion of a culture of compliance uh, is adequate to monitor and police MPAs? Uh, it, um, I, 
I think at the moment, yes. I mean, I, I'm aware of the FOI. Um, and, you know, I would say that, I mean, that's a very kind of raw data uh, um, to be extrapolating from because it, these are just reports and there can be multiple reports about a single incident. Um, that wouldn't necessarily, you know, show because each one of those multiple reports would be logged as a report. So the 78 reports aren't necessarily 78 incidents. So I think that's something that needs to be thought about. Um, uh, all of that that would illustrate your point. Um, no, well, I, I'm, 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 as far as I understand it, there is, for example, one vessel that gives rise to 25% of the reports. Right. So I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know the name of the vessel, and I'm no, not sure it would be appropriate to say it. But, but that's the kind of thing that that very raw data, when you look behind it, and I haven't looked at all the, all of that. I'm just aware of the of the um, of of that total, but they don't all they don't all um, relate to 70. It's not 78 separate incidents. And Graham will know more yeah, about this yeah. than I do. Uh, I, I mean, uh, there, there was one incident where there were 19 reports about a, a single vessel, uh, and there are several others where, where there were a number of reports. And, of course, the fact that there was a report doesn't necessarily mean that something has necessarily been, been done wrong. It just is that somebody thinks there might be something uh, going wrong. So I think that it slightly overstates it, and we did, I think, explain it to the people who were putting the FOI exactly what lay behind it, but I think they preferred the the, the sort of um, high-level figure that, than, than the underlying reality. However, that doesn't mean to say that we're complacent. Um, um, it does rely, we do rely on, on people reporting what they see, uh, and I think that's, that's a good thing, because I think it's a, a responsibility for everyone involved in coastal communities to try and support the MPA networks. That, that, that's a good thing. But there are gaps. We don't have um, monitoring of smaller vessels uh, um, in, in the way we do for larger vessels. We've currently got an experiment looking to see if that, that might be something that we, we could extend, and we've got some smaller vessels that we are trying to monitor in that way. So there are gaps uh, you know, that we will try and fill. But overall, I have to say that the, the feedback we've been getting is that most people are supportive of MPAs, most people are compliant, most people are trying to make sure that they actually do work. We have to just make sure that we have the, the resources in place to deal with the, the rogues who, who, you know, there will be always be a small number who decide that the rules are not for them, they're just for everyone else. So uh, I think we, we will continue to rely on getting reports from, from people and, and reacting to them as quickly as we can. And the most spectacular case over the last year of, of an issue was the Loch Caron issue, and that arose because that was reported that people, people flag that up. So I think there is a kind of, people are watching what happens, so. Picking up on your reliance on, on reports, we, we know that increasingly we're relying on NGOs to, uh, to monitor uh, the coastal environment. Um, would you say that NGOs and the fishermen themselves are adequately trained and equipped to monitor MPAs? And, and what procedures should they be following? Uh, if they suspect illegal activities taking place? Um, well, I, I'm not sure it's our job to be training NGOs or anybody else in terms of, uh, of what they're doing. I presume they undertake their own um, uh, uh, um, uh, training and, um, uh, and work. I mean, I, I don't know if Graham wants to come in on some of the interactions he has with um, uh, ENGOs. Um, I, I mean, fishermen are also part of this process. Um, in fairness, it's not just. It's available yeah. though. There, there is available on our website. There is a telephone number for people to report uh, what they see. But I suppose perhaps the point being made is, 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 would people be able to recognise when there was something that, that, yeah. that needed being reported in the first place? We have guidance out there, but that doesn't mean to say that that's you know that's all we can do. I think we we. It, we, you know, we can't train everyone in the world, but we can, I think, um, try and support organisations or large groups where they're wanting to know what they, what they could, should be looking for. And we will certainly, we're always happy to talk to groups to, to see how we can support that. Because it is important, obviously, people have to know what it is they're seeing in order to be able to report it in the first place. So if there are ways in which we can work with other bodies to improve that, we will certainly continue to do so. And we already do quite a lot of that. Okay. Um, 
clearly the introduction of new technology is going to help significantly with regard to, to compliance. Um, do you regularly consider and test uh, the, the new technology that's coming in? Um, and is, is there fix enough flexibility in Marine Scotland's budget to allow for uh, capital spending on new technology? I'm thinking, for example, um, it got quite a bit of coverage in the fisheries debate last week the, or the week before, the, the remote electronic monitoring, which has been introduced to the whole fleet in uh, New Zealand. Um, is there much thought given to that? Um, I, th I think that we're always looking at new technology. Um, <coughs> Um, at the moment, we're looking at a range of that. that that's, you know, we already are using drones. Uh, we use satellite te technology. We will certainly use monitoring devices. At the moment, probably looking more towards the larger boats, but actually we could look beyond that. We could look to camera technology. All of that, I think, is, 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 is a picture of where we're going to go in, in the future. Um, as, as to what the, the costs might be and, and where those might actually lie, I think that, that, that probably is, the, is the, the question after we decided what the, the best technology is. And I'm sure if, you know, if we were able to come up with a, a good case to put to ministers that said, I'll, I'll say that now where I've got a captive audience, uh, but some of that might well be that actually it means that we can, we can you know, make efficiencies elsewhere by not having to use other bits of, of compliance activity in order to free up resource to fund something that's more effective. So at, at the moment, we're, we're not in a position where we've been looking for anything um, that, that we've been unable to deliver. But the technology is moving on very quickly, uh, and, and, and we're trying to make sure that we're absolutely on top of it. And I think the use of drones is, is one of... There are limitations on drones. They can't replace everything we do, but we have found them useful in some circumstances. The, the, other, the only other thing I've mentioned about that is, of course, whenever you introduce a compliance measure, uh, that's fine for everyone who's compliant, but those who want to not comply, we'll try and find a way of getting around that. So you introduce drones and people will introduce something to try and combat zones as well, so, drones as well. So yeah, it, it is an ongoing process. I don't think there's a silver bullet around Delhi. Um, acknowledging the Cabinet Secretary's earlier uh, remarks regarding the uh, charging regime and, and how it's at a, a, very, a very early stage, um, could, for example, costs... Are you in a position to say whether, for example, um, costs for cameras uh, could fall on the fishermen themselves? Or I, I don't think we're at a position where, where we, we could say that. Uh, uh, and we, I don't think we've got to that level. And we've certainly had no discussions with the cab, uh, Cabinet Secretary about that. But it is also a very broad industry. You have some you know, you have some very large fleets and very wealthy uh, uh, fishing fleets, and you have some very small boats, which are, which are you know, in a, in a very different situation. So I think that all of those factors, I think, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Cabinet Secretary would want to know and consider before thinking about that aspect. I think the information that I got for the, the fisheries debate, the REM uh, monitoring costs about £4,000 per vessel. So just not, not, uh, not excessive. Well, it might not be excessive for one of the big guys, but for the smaller fishing boats, it might be pretty, pretty significant. Um, um, I mean, there's a huge variability in the income and and you know what have you. And fishermen, they're not they're not all um, fishing the same way. Thank you. Or making as much money as each other. Yeah. I'm sure just, they would like it if they were. <laughs> yeah. Just to get a feel for the kind of numbers here, because the Cabinet Secretary has effectively thrown a challenge down to those of us who are pointing to areas of the budget where we think there could be more money spent, and rightly so, about identifying where it would come from. So looking at the new technologies, which cost that, that you're looking at, are we talking here about millions of pounds, tens of millions of pounds? What, what sort of figures, if you were to get what you wanted to, to really make this work? I, I, I would hesitate to, to, to put a, a, an estimate on that because of the range of technologies we might be talking about. Because you know we could be talking about we have aircraft at the moment that we use. It could be a, additioning additional quite expensive uh, uh, equipment for that, or it could be quite low tech equipment around around individual boats. So I, I, I'm I'm quite happy to have a think about it and probably uh, when I speak to you again, see whether we can narrow it down. But I don't at the moment we, we don't have a, a plan. One of the things uh, I think I might have mentioned that, 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 that when, I, when I met you before is that we are looking at our overall compliance activity and our strategy to try and work out how we can best um, encourage people to comply and catch those who decide not to comply. And, and that will be part of that. And, and at that stage, I think we'd probably be, a, be in a better position. Amassing the shopping list, the price hasn't been worked out. Uh, uh, can I just say, 
has <laughs> to this point. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that when any organisation is amassing their shopping list, which is a perfectly understandable for them, thing for them to want to do, that they speak to their um, colleagues. So, you know, it occurs to me that if we're talking about drone technology, there's more than one, you know, SNH, SEPA, Marine Scotland. It doesn't all necessarily, um, you know, have to be everybody setting up their own drone fleet or whatever you call collection of drones. But, uh, you know, there may be, there may be kind of uh, um, abilities there to, to share some of this um, cost. And I would... I would very much hope that that's a conversation that's being had, she it, said, it, looking it, around it, the table. It, it certainly is a conversation. <laughs> Sorry. It, it is a conversation we are, and we are talking about, for example, our, our um, fishing, our, our, our naval vessels uh, as to uh, how we can best use them, but how can we can work with other people such as SEPA and SNH to get the yeah. most, best for the Scottish Government and the Scottish people. Thank you very much. Stevenson, and just now. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. The, um, the panel will know that the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas is the world's oldest intergovernmental organisation founded in 1902 in Copenhagen. And, of course, very much at the initiative of fishermen and scientists working together even then. So, looking at uh, the most widely available technology, the Mark I eyeball, um, do fishermen and anyone else who becomes aware of potential transgressions of the rules in relation to MPAs and other environmental issues in fishing, do they know who to call? Or is it time to crank up uh, the knowledge of the telephone number and where to report such possible infractions? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm absolutely uh, sure that, that, that most people will, will know how, where to get the, the telephone number. I think we actually have it in front of us somewhere, but I'll probably, probably give, it, give it to you t today. But you're right, I think we need to make that more explicit. It is very obvious. <laughs> 0131 It's the UK Fisheries Monitoring Centre. And, and that is it's a UK monitoring centre, but it's run here in Scotland, and it's it's 24/7. Uh, uh, and so, uh, but I, I do I do take the point that you know having a number is not enough. We have to be able to publicise it and make sure that people know. I think you will find if you go around the Marine Scotland uh, um, offices around the country that it is available there. But we can, you know, I, I, if there's more we can do, we will certainly do that. Avid readers of the OR catered for. I think you've a wider audience to reach. <laughs> uh, John Scott. Thank you, and that's another first for this committee, giving out hotline numbers. But um, before I come to the question about research, I'm just wanting to sort of make a suggestion and ask you to agree with it or disagree with it, Cabinet Secretary, really. And I noticed that the marked increase in the capital budget at level four for uh, sustainable and active travel from 20 million to 65 uh, million in the draft budget. Now, one could argue, uh, if one chose to, I'm just asking you to comment on it, that you know the, the basics of environmental enhancement, that um, CEPA, SNH, um, even research, uh, these these things are possibly being neglected. Flatlining is the word that we are using. You're saying staying the same. Um, is it is it at the expense of, of sustainable and active travel? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I did indicate right at the start of this our overall budget has gone up, it hasn't gone down overall, so there have been some decisions had to be made within the budget, but that's within my budget, and my budget is not, <coughs> is not spending on this. This comes out of the rural economy and transport budget. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, as I said earlier, I didn't want to poke the bear, given that I do have an, um, a, a small increase in the overall budget. Um, so that big increase there, um, uh, I, I think you would have to perhaps ask within that portfolio how, how that was achieved. <laughs> but I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth because I think that then has a, a you know, big knock-on effect for everybody, very positive one. So okay. Just before John Scott goes on, are you aware of the Green Bus Fund that sits within that? Uh, and the new fund for retrofitting. Uh, oh, um, it's just the wording's a bit ambiguous, and it might suggest that it that it does sit there. I realise it's not your portfolio. No, responsibility. I, I just I, I wouldn't want to mislead by by yeah. saying off the top of my head where the Green Bus Fund sits. Perhaps Neil's 
Uh, the retrofitting... Um, uh, Okay, the, the work being done to establish an engine retrofitting centre in Scotland is actually in the low emission zone okay. sort of section of the okay. uh, of this, rather than the active transport section. Okay. But we'll check on the green bus fund because I can't immediately say. Okay, yeah. that would be helpful. Thank you for that. Yeah. And John Scott. Thank you. And returning now to um, your budget area of responsibility, Cabinet Secretary, uh, the committee has been told that budget reductions have impacted on long-term research and data sets. How can such long-term and valuable data sets uh, and research be protected in the current climate, noting uh, the reduction in the research budgets? Um, well, I think the, um, uh, the long-term research, I, th I think the majority of what um, the research providers do is long-term research. It's about 90% of what they do is long-term research. Um, so um, I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what they might have been trying to express there because um, most, of the, uh, um, um, most of the research programme would be regarded as long-term research. Um, I, I mean, we, we regard that as absolutely fundamental and it has an enormous knock-on effect um, the, the, the research is one of the, what I gather to be kind of like a sort of unsung hero um, in, uh, in, in this portfolio. Um, and um, I think um, they do incredibly well. And I worked very hard um, to make sure that they were protected as much as possible um, in terms of, um, uh, all of this year's budget round um, for that reason. So, um, yeah, there are some... Uh, uh, you know, there is some tightening. Um, we know that they can manage this. Um, the Royal Botanic Garden is getting some capital spend to do some of the work that they needed to do, which I think they were delighted to get. I think they were concerned that that wasn't going to happen and they're, they're, they're happy that it is happening now. Um, but I'm very, um, uh, um, very much of the view that the, the research programme that jointly is delivered by all of these research providers is is incredibly important um, and delivers an enormous benefit to um, the economy, um, not to mention jobs. So although um, things get squeezed a little uh, um, and they have to work hard um, to continue to ensure that they've got funding for research, not just from Scottish Government, but from other sources, um, that they are um, still in a pretty good place. Um, notwithstanding, and uh, while I don't uh, have the figures exactly to hand, but there has been quite a drop in the research budget, as I understand it, um, th this year. And um, it's a matter of great concern. In fact, now that I look at the figures and read them, it's from... Um, in 2014 through to now, it's from 76 million to the projected budget of down to 64 million. So that's a drop of over 12 million pounds in the last four years. Um, and I, I know that there's a, a huge um, amount of, of worry in the research institutes about that reduction in funding, and also, um, also the the fact that it's year to year to year funding in terms of staff and evidence that we've heard um, being having to be fired before the budget actually comes out in terms of their ability to meet the employment regulations. They have to be given notice, um, what's the correct term, notice to leave, as it were, and then they have to be re-engaged in terms of the 90, 90 days, is it, uh, in terms of redundancy. Um, law, so that's the that's the difficulty of year on year funding because slightly, they cannot guarantee that I'm the staff will still have a job. I'm slightly confused because all of the research providers operate on the basis of no compulsory redundancies. So I think what you must be talking about staff who are employed for a year or a limited a time limited period, it, 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 because because they don't they don't the, the research providers. Um, uh, comply with the no compulsory redundancy mm. policy. So if there are people who are perhaps, you know, in a different category, maybe employed 
for a <coughs> time limited period or for the duration of a specific project or something uh, i that is a kind of slightly different category but but i'm you know i'm not i'm not sure that's different to a lot of other organizations and one of the it's one of the downsides of you know single year budgeting that, that you, you the don't the point i'm making well you know our budget's a single year budget from westminster so the day westminster decides to actually multiply the number of years that it's giving us budget for we will then be able to look again at, at some of that but we're kind of trapped all of us in that single year budgeting right and and just reverting back to the point of a reduction of 12.5 million in the last four years in the research analysis budget um can you just justify that if you choose to you know, um, as I indicated, yes, there are some squeezes uh, in some parts of the portfolio. Um, and um, as far as possible, I've tried to ensure um, that no area, and that included the research providers, was going to be put into a position where they really weren't able to um, continue to do um, their, their job. We, we are not the sole provider of research funding. Um, you know, we, we provide a significant amount of research funding. Um, but, uh, uh, but, you know, research providers have got to um, and do uh, lever in um, funding from other sources. So we are um, w encouraging them to, to continue to do that, and that will become a more um, uh, acute issue once we, we have to deal with the fallout from Brexit. Um, and I've also had a number of meetings with the research providers jointly and you know we need them to um, find ways of uh, maximizing um, efficiencies across the board I mean the there are I think six in total the six six, six research providers um, every single one of them um, <coughs> is working very well but I think that there are some um, uh, some savings can be made by them working with each other perhaps more than has been the case in the past and trying to encourage them to do that um, and that's one of the reasons why you've seen the advent of safari the the the, the kind of joint organization of research providers on that point we were told last week that there had been no real duplication of research identified so i take it the kind of thing you're getting at is perhaps to HR, six HR I'm, departments. That's exactly that the kind of thing. thing. I, I try to encourage them to think into the longer term about you know some of that aspect of what they do. They all do. Um, you know, the research work they all do is 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 you know is 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 quite specific to each of them. But there are aspects um, of their organisations which I think they need to kind of think about, um, uh, maintain their individual identities, but think about whether or not they can maximise um, uh, benefit from some of those areas that aren't directly with, to do with their research. But that, that's, you know, that's, that's a conversation that um, it is, is a longer term conversation. And I regard the advent of Safari as a really good signal that they are beginning to think along these lines. I think I think we would all uh, welcome the advent of Safari. Um, I must say, uh, certainly speaking personally, I do. But um, you're confident, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that the balance is right between the Scottish Government funding of research to address immediate challenges and the longer term strategic. Look, I mean, I, if 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 there was more money that I could give them, I would be giving them more money. Um, this balance is the best that we can manage. In the current circumstances, yes. Okay. Um, having heard what you've just said and, and the point that you made about world-renowned research institutions being able to secure funding from other sources for their research, there is, of course, the issue about maintaining buildings, campuses, etc. And you, you referenced the additional money, the very welcome additional money that's gone to the botanics, but that's 2.6 million when they estimate they have a backlog of 15 million. I think we were given evidence as well from the James Hutton Institute that in one year their support for capital 
uh, had gone down from three million to a fraction of that. And I think I'm right in saying the Scottish Government owns their Invergowrie campus. So how mindful are you, Cabinet Secretary, of the pressures on our research institutes around uh, capital um, matters? Very, very much so. Um, I mean, I, I meet with them regularly, so I am conscious of the challenges that they, um, they face. Um, we have, for some considerable time now, been encouraging um, the bidding of research grants to be done on a full economic cost basis, which would wrap into it the, the issues um, around maintenance um, uh, and repair. Um, and um, uh, Scottish Government funding, as I understand it, is made at a 100% um, full economic cost basis. So, you know, we are, we are doing what we, uh, what we can. We do understand um, those challenges. Now, that's, that deals with the kind of maintenance and repair. That obviously doesn't deal with significant capital spend, such as the Royal Botanic Gardens is, is looking for. Um, uh, now, you know, um, again, if I could identify uh, these sorts of significant sums of money within the budget to... to um, to allocate to them, I would be only too happy to do so. But something else within the portfolio budget would have to suffer. And it's not immediately obvious if I am to increase funding to SNH, increase funding to SEPA, increase funding to all the research providers, including capital spend, where, where that increase in funding is to come from. Accepting those points, of course, if you, if you take the example of the botanics, the contribution they make to tackling species loss is absolutely mm -hmm. colossal. Absolutely. Um, so. Yes, yes. Um, we're coming to the end. I'm, I'm looking on the table to see if members have any other questions. Mark, Mark Ruskell. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I just wanted to go back to uh, the discussion that we had as part of the air quality inquiry. I asked you about the consequential monies that are due to come to Scotland as a result of increased spend on air quality in England and Wales. I think at the time um, you couldn't answer that because it was pre the budget. But can you answer that question now? How much ex additional money has Scotland got as a result of that additional spend in England and Wales? And has that money actually been ring fenced for air quality work? 20 million. In the 20 million? Okay. Yes. And can I ask, has that money been ring fenced for air quality work in Scotland? How does that translate into the budget that's before us? Uh, the 20 million was factored into the decisions that Cabinet took in terms of the allocations. I think it's worth highlighting that, in terms of the number of actions that will support air quality, they're not just limited to what is in the Eclair portfolio, but uh, the issue of the. Um, the low emission yeah, zone funding. 10, 10 million allocated to low emission zone um, yeah, The active capital. travel we've already referred um, to. Yeah, so there are, it, it has gone to I think it would be areas. useful if we could see uh, how that additional money has been spent in relation to the budget that you're already predicting for the next year and perhaps break, break that down. I would certainly find that useful, Convener, if we could get that information. That. So we can track where the money's okay. gone okay. and where it's going. Uh, Finlay Carson. I think we, we, we did touch on <clears throat> single-year budgets. Um, and uh, what I would like to, to, to look at again, are you ruling out moving away from single-year budgets? Because we've heard evidence from uh, the likes of Climate Exchange and the, the James Hutton Institutes, which have both stated that they could be far more ambitious and they'd be in a better position uh, moving forward to increase uh, excellence if, if they moved away from a, a, sung, a single year budget. Uh, and you would imagine you would get more bang for your buck. Are, are you ruling out? First of all, um, I think that's a question you need to sp speak to the Finance Secretary about. Um, uh, there are a very small number of <coughs> things that we do commit ourselves, it's not multi-year budgeting, but we do commit ourselves into the future. So, for example, the £42 million a year that goes to flooding, we've committed to finding that, regardless of any other budget issues. So, 
Um, uh, and I think the £10 million land fund was in that category um, uh, as well. But they're not, that's not multi-year budgeting as such. That is basically being able to say up front that that's what the allocation will be, notwithstanding the rest of it. The difficulty I have, and I'm not the finance secretary, but the difficulty I have with this is that, as I understand it, you know, the, the, the Westminster budget this year is a, was, was effectively a one-year budget. So our, our block grant, the grant that we've got from Westminster is a single year's grant. Now, you know, um, uh, uh, whether or not uh, the advent of the various tax powers allows there to be some element of multi-year thinking entering into what we do, um, I can't, I'm not technically you know, able to answer that. I think most of us would prefer if we could think, and it's, it's not that long ago there were three-year budgets, you know, it's, it's, we're in the place we're at at the moment is because, is because we're not getting multi-year budgets from Westminster. And if we don't get multi-year budgets from Westminster, it's extremely hard for us to be able to deliver a multi-year budget um, uh, in the way that we would understand it. So there will be the, the small number of things that one's prepared to commit to in absolute terms, but that's not multi-year budgeting as such. It just gives a certain consistency and, um, and predictability about things in some small areas. But you couldn't do that across the board because without the certainty of what your budget in total was going to be, how could you manage a multi-year budget? Uh, and that's a kind of... I, th I think that's a kind of much more fundamental point. I don't think any of us think this, you know, one-year budgeting is ideal, but for all the reasons which people have, have spoken about. I, I appreciate that the, the, the budget for flooding and whatever is important not to be a single year, but I, th I think it's particularly pertinent to, to research that they're not just looking at one year in advance. Is, is it something you'll look into how you could potentially provide uh, more than a one-year budget, budget for, for the research side of the budget? Is it something you, you would look into in more detail? I mean, you know, we can look at it, but for all of these research providers, we are only providing about half the research funding, sometimes less than half the research funding. So we're not the sole provider. So they would still be required to be looking around I mean, you know, at, at, at others, and I, 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 um, I mean, we, we can we can look at doing the equivalent of flooding, the, the 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 promise on the flood funding. You could do you could look to do the equivalent, but then arguably everybody across the board would want you to be doing the equivalent, and then we wouldn't really be any further forward. Until we see what the post-Brexit landscape looks like, it's impossible to I, contemplate these I, things. I don't even want to think about what next year's budget is going to have, because we'll be right in the middle of that, of that period of really total uncertainty that, that it's going to be extremely difficult. Okay. Uh, anybody else got any questions? Um, and, and wrapping this up, Cabinet Secretary, did you find the information on the um, emissions reductions in agriculture sector, or do you want to write to us? Yeah. Said some of it already without okay, so actually finding it. So, um, uh, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll perhaps add that for the cabinet secretary for uh, rural economy to to perhaps clarify if he thinks there's a better way to express okay. it. So you'll take those things yep. back to one behalf. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that, and thank you for your time and that of your officials uh, today. Okay. Can I wish all of you a very good Christmas when it comes? Um, at its next meeting on the 9th of January, the committee will consider its report on the draft budget. In the meantime, um, we'll now move into private session, and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.